Today's episode is called The Truth About Reformers. We're going to take a look at the reformers that have come about and changed history. And I would like you to think about what side of history you would be on. And then we're going to apply it to modern day and see where you're at and see if you could be a reformer. Hey guys, it's Amber, wife, mother, warrior, type A child of God. Here at Little Things, we examine everyday issues from a biblical perspective with one simple goal, to know and love God more. Thanks for joining me. So on this day, October 31st in 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the church door in Wittenberg. And effectively as he did this, he was waging war on the Catholic Church. Now I'm not entirely sure that his intention to wait was to wage war, but that's in essence what happened because he was attacking the very things that the Catholic Church stood for in his time. So what were those things? First of all, In the Catholic Church, you earned your salvation, either by the things that you did or by buying what was called an indulgence. And as Luther studied scripture, he realized that's not the case. Grace is free. There's nothing we can do. It's not by works. There's nothing we can do to earn the salvation that Jesus won for us and freely gives to us. So we had an issue with that. Some of the other things that Martin Luther was all about is getting the Bible in the hands of the people. So up until that point, it wasn't available to people. They didn't have just Bibles laying around their house. The priests were the ones who had access to scripture. And so people couldn't read the word themselves to know what it said. They only had what they were told through the priests. And with the invention of the printing press, especially, Luther wanted to get the Bible um, in German so the people, the common, everyday, ordinary person could have a Bible of their own. Um, He also wanted people to just understand the freedom that was theirs in Christ. So Martin had been a monk, and he had whipped himself and fasted and tried to do all kinds of things. Again, this goes right back to that whole idea and the concept of earning grace. But Luther really wanted people to be free and to realize that the essence of Jesus' work on the cross was the idea that they did not have to do anything. So that was what he was standing on. Now, what happened because of this um, act of putting the 95 Theses on the door in Wittenberg? Well, not long afterwards, about eight months later, he went to trial for heresy. That eventually led to excommunication. Luther's life was endangered. He was threatened. He was um, sought after. Uh, some people thought the wrong ideas about Luther. So as his ideas grew and spread throughout Europe, people thought that he was about freedom, but not the biblical freedom he was talking about. They thought maybe he was starting a revolution, a social revolution, so that, you know, politically, they didn't have to really live underneath the princes of their day. And even the Catholic Church at that time had a lot of political power. And so they thought that he was starting a rebellion against politics and, and social justice. And and that really wasn't what he was all about. And so he faced this um, the courts, and he faced the church, and he faced people not getting the truth about what he was trying to do. So 500 years later, it's all very romantic. You know, we look at Luther and we think, man, he was just so wonderful and he really did a great thing. But let's face it, he was trouble. He was trouble for the people who just wanted to coast. He was trouble when he started messing with the way things worked in religion at that time. He caused a lot of trouble for a lot of people. And his life and others' lives became difficult because of it. They became messy. So while we like to think that Luther was just this really unbelievable reformer, and he was, I'm not saying he wasn't, let's not forget the cost of what he did, the cost to himself and to those around him. 
fast for forward quite a ways um, to Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He saw from day one that Adolf Hitler was not um, doing things biblically. He saw through him and he saw that this is not a man who would lead Germany in the direction it should go. In fact, two days after Hitler became the chancellor of Germany in 1933, Bonhoeffer went on the radio and denounced him. Partway through his radio broadcast, he was disconnected. That didn't stop him, though. He went on to um, form as the national church, said that Jews could no longer hold leadership positions. He went on with about a third of pastors at the time in German, Germany to protest by forming what it was called the Emergency League. He was offered a position as a pastor in Berlin later that year, and he refused because he was standing against what was going on. And he instead went to London. And when he went there, he was quoted as saying, I have found little support for my views, even among friends. It's time to go into the desert for a while. He said this, and one of his friends said, and what of the German church, Bonhoeffer? That's nice that you're able to leave, but what about the German church? And he really took these words to heart, so much so that he returned to Germany in 1935. By 1936, he was declared an enemy of the state. In 1938, he had a chance to go to America, and he did. He went. He lasted two weeks before he realized that he had to go back and fight what was going on, the evil that was happening in his native land. He said, I have come to the conclusion that I made a mistake in coming to America. I must live through this difficult period in our national history with the people of Germany. I will have no right to participate in the reconstruction of Christian life in Germany after the war if I do not share the trials of this time with my people. Christians in Germany will have to face the terrible alternative of either willing the defeat of their nation in order that Christian civilization may survive or willing the victory of their nation and thereby destroying civilization. I know which of these alternatives I must choose but I cannot make that choice from security. So he went back. He fought. He continued to speak against Hitler and what he was doing. And it led to him being imprisoned. And finally, a month before World War II came to an end, Bonhoeffer was hung. So let's just be clear. Bonhoeffer lost a lot of friends. Some just couldn't stand to hear what he had to keep saying. He had to keep causing troubles. He couldn't be quiet. He couldn't just preach the word in the underground. He had to speak up and try to get others to speak up as well. He had a chance to escape, not once but twice. And he left, but he came back. He, he felt called to the fight. And because of it, he lost his life. I often wondered why he did what he did. Why didn't he just do things quietly? But I think I understand now that once he knew the truth, he felt compelled to educate others. And he felt that to live any other way was to live a lie. And he couldn't live with himself if he was living a lie. So because of that, he spoke up. Look at David in the Bible. David's father, Jesse, asked him to take some supplies to his older brothers in the army. And he arrived and he saw the troops were covering. Twice a day, in the morning and the evening, Goliath would come out and he would make fun of the troops of Israel. He would defy God. He would put him down. Who's your God? Look at me. Come fight me and we'll serve you if I'm defeated. You'll serve us if we're defeated. And what were all the people doing? All the people, everyone in the army, every man was shaking with fear. 
What was the king doing? He was sitting in his tent. He wasn't going to go out and fight. So David comes. He hears Goliath. And he was appalled. Are you kidding me? Who is this who is defying the God of Israel? What's going on here? Why are you guys all just sitting here? What what does the person who defeats Goliath get? And immediately he draws opposition. From who? Well, from his brother, for, for one. His older brother said, why have you come? With whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. So David stands up and goes, guys, this is not okay. We should be standing up and standing with God and not being okay with this guy who is making fun of God and putting God down and treating God like he's just a little idol. And because of that, he's put down. He's made to feel small. You only have a few sheep. Who do you think you are? His motives are questioned. Your heart's just conceited. You're just full of yourself and your heart's wicked. Just sit down and shut up, David. Nobody wants you here. You think you can do something about this? You're nobody. You are a young, little teenager who has no business being on the front yard, or front line. So why don't you just go away? So David was just supposed to sit down and huddle with the others who were shaking and not doing anything. Despite that opposition, despite his own brother calling him out and saying, you don't know what you're doing. You have no business being here and look at how wicked you are. David persisted. He wasn't going to be silenced. If no one else was willing to fight, he was going to go and do that. That's what a reformer does. So what are some of the attributes we see in the reformers? Well, first of all, there's a discontent. They're not content with the status quo. They see an evil of some sort, and they aren't able to let it go. Listen, a lot of other people may be complaining. People on Luther's Day might have complained, man, this church is crazy. I don't have the money to buy my forgiveness. I feel so overwhelmed, like I can never do enough. Bonhoeffer, you know, in his Germany in in that time, many were probably saying, man, what's going on is really, really bad. But they weren't willing to stand up. All the troops were cowering. A reformer is stirred to action by their discontent. They see the truth and they are not going to just sit down and shut up because too many people are willing to not do anything because they would value their life over the truth. No one wants to really make waves. And so they're willing to put on their blinders and accept what they're told because they don't have the courage to do anything else. So number two, reformers need immovable courage. Despite the opposition, despite the hardship, the criticism, the death threats, prison, bad health, no matter what they face, they know what is true. And because they believe what they are fighting for, is worthy of their efforts, they will go against the forces of evil and they will not back down. Immovable courage. And third, a fierce kind of trust in God that doesn't matter, that doesn't care if they make it out alive. It it makes no difference if they're the ones who brings success in the fight, or if they die trying, doesn't make a difference because they know what is right and what is true. Look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, listen, my God is the greatest. I make this huge idol. I make this statue. Everybody bow down to it. Worship it because that shows that you are acknowledging my God is the greatest. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
they were nobles in captivity in Babylon. And their outward circumstances, by all means, weren't the best. But they had already been delivered twice by God. First, when they came and they asked not to have to defile themselves by the food that they ate and the the um, the guard or the person in charge of them said, hey, listen, I'm empathetic towards what you're saying, but this is the deal. The king will have my head. And so they said, well, would you just give us a chance to try it out? And 10 days later, they looked better than everybody else. So they were able to not defile themselves and their Jewish heritage and what they ate. And then when Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he insisted that all the wise men had to tell him what his dream was and interpret it, or they were all going to die, they didn't even know about it until the executioner arrived at their door. And then Daniel went and asked for time and they prayed and God gave him the interpretation of the dream. And so they not only saved themselves, God not only saved them. But all the wise men, all the astrologers and enchanters and magicians, because of what God had done for them. And so when they were told, you have to bow down and worship this idol, they said, no. And Nebuchadnezzar was so mad when he heard about this, that he stoked the fire made it blazing hot. And their answer to him was, listen, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us. And he will rescue us from your hand. But even if he does not, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold. In essence, they said, our life is not really that big of a deal. God is worthy of our allegiance, and even if it means our death. That's the fierce trust that reformers have. They're not going to give up one way or the other. Look at John the Baptist. I love how in the TV show The Chosen, um, they call him Crazy John because He did not fit in with the rest of society. He dressed weird. He ate weird things. He lived out in the desert. And listen, he didn't play it safe. When the Pharisees came out, he called them a brood of vipers. When Herod took his brother's wife to be his own wife, he called them out. Why didn't he just keep quiet? He could keep preaching along the banks of the Jordan. He could make great strides in the kingdom, but he had to open his mouth all the time. Well, what was he teaching? He was teaching repentance. When he saw evil, he called it out. He was not worried about the consequences. That's a reformer. I have three quotes that I'm going to give you to make you think about this further. So John Kelvin said, a dog barks when his master is attacked. I would be a coward if I saw that God's truth is attacked and yet would remain silent. How many things in our society aren't an attack on God's word, and yet by and large Christians sit by and don't do anything about it? We don't speak up. We don't say, no, that's not right. No, this is the truth. This is what we need to be be talking about, and this is what we need to believe, and we don't want this taught in our schools. But by and large, we've sat back and said nothing. Kelvin said, listen, even a dog stands up when his master is attacked and says, no, how can we let God's word be attacked over and over and over and sit quietly by? Jonathan Edwards said, Resolution one, I will live for God. Resolution two, if no one else does, I still will. Edwards resolved, look, I'll do this alone. I don't want to do it alone, but I'm willing to do it alone. I'm willing to be the crazy John. I'm willing to be the crazy person, the David, whose brothers are saying, sit down and shut up. Just be quiet. And David said, no. No, 
I know that God is with me. I don't care. I'm not going to sit and listen to this guy talk about God that way. Bonhoeffer, who said, look, this is not okay. They're telling Jews they can't be in church. They can't be pastors. They can't, they can't be with people because of their nationality. That's craziness. Are you guys, are, you guys are okay with this? What are they doing with this, these Jews who are taken away and put some, what, are you guys okay with this? Luther, who was seeing society desperately, desperately trying to earn heaven. And Luther was saying, I'm not okay with this. I saw with my own eyes, God opened my heart to the truth of scripture. There is no way I can hold my tongue while people are trying desperately to earn their salvation. I will go down fighting and I will go down by myself if I have to but I have to stand up for the truth. In fact, Luther said, where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. We're good at shutting our eyes to the battle. And we're good at running away to the comfort of our home and just turning on the TV and and not dealing with things. Is that the kind of person you want to be? Listen, I am not saying that every single person who's listening to this right now needs to stand on a soapbox, go out and tell society everything they're doing wrong. I am not suggesting that at all. I am suggesting in our conversations with our friends and our neighbors, when we have the opportunity to speak the truth in love, we take that opportunity that we Stand up for the things of God. I am suggesting that we pray for the people who are out front, the ones who are in front of the cameras, the ones who are in front of the microphones, the ones who are taking their stand in the sand and saying, listen, as a Christian, I cannot be okay with this. I'm suggesting we be in prayer for those people. And I'm suggesting we keep our eyes wide open. Pray for truth. Pray that God reveals to you the battles that are going on right now. Why? So that you can support the reformers around you. Maybe you're going to do that with money. And maybe you're going to do that with prayers. And maybe your voice is going to be one more voice in the society. And maybe you're going to open your home to people who are fighting the battle. Or maybe you're going to be able to encourage them some other way. Pray that your eyes are open to the battles that are being fought today. Be willing to step into the battle. Don't look at the reformers as the crazy people who are standing up and speaking out. But instead, say, God, you know what? I'm willing to stand for the truth. This has been Little Things, because in God's kingdom, the little things are the big things. Hey, guess what? Those teaching videos you've come to love from Time of Grace are available in podcast form. If you're gone a week, or you want to hear the lessons all at once, or if you just want to concentrate on the teaching, check out Grace Talk's daily devotionals anywhere you listen to podcasts. You may think you are just one person, but trust me when I say each person's prayers are heard and each person's support matters. We appreciate each and every one of you. If you haven't yet, please take the time to rate and review Little Things today and share it with others. Thank you and God bless.